just to put my talk in the context, so mostly here and also a lot these days, we are talking about machine learning or physics. So here I just put like a couple of the things in which I have been involved with more on the organizational side than on the research side so far. But that's not what I will be talking about today. I will be talking about the other direction how physics is used to machine learning. So we already also had some of that today. And here I'm just giving you a quote of Jan Lecan after he attended and lectured at a conference that we organized this summer that was called Statistical Physics and Machine Learning Back Together. And you will understand why back together. Some participants are in the audience. And he was saying that there is a long history of theoretical physics bringing ideas and mathematical methods to machine learning and neural networks. And with the prevalence of deep learning and all the theoretical questions that surround it, physicists are coming back. And that's kind of what the school was about. But so let me start with when he says the theoretical questions that surround deep learning, like just a selection of three of them that I like to think about just to be on the same line. So what we don't still understand on the theory side in deep learning today is, for instance, this puzzle of generalization. So there has been this paper that nowadays is really kind of well known, a couple of years in iClear, that kind of put in question the traditional theories in learning theory that say that if we take the data set with completely random labels and we can fit the random labels to zero loss, then a network like that should not generalize well, whereas in practice they do generalize well. But the theory doesn't explain that. So we need a different theory. And we still, you know, there has been a lot of work following up on that since, but we still are not yet there. And related to that is this puzzle of overfitting. So this will be a picture that you would find in pretty much every book on machine learning where you put the prediction error here and as a function of the model complexity, so the more parameters you are fitting, the somehow better fit you can get, but the worse you should be, at some point you should start to be worse on the test data. That's kind of the traditional paradigm page 10 on every book. But this does not seem to be happening in deep learning. This orange line in deep learning just continues going down as the number of parameters is growing. So how comes that's the case? We don't really understand either. And finally, this question, or finally, at least in my three slides here, of sample complexity, which is something I like to focus on is, and here's the typical example of, of one of the data sets, the CIFAR 10, on which everybody is like testing their, their program, their, their, their implementations, that has 10 classes and 50,000 of samples. And we like benchmark a lot of the methods on this. But way less often we ask the question, what if we had fewer samples? Like, could we still do that well? Or what is the minimum number of samples? And if it relates to that, but then there is a lot of maybe biology in it, so it's not so related to the question. You know, certainly a child doesn't need 10,000 samples per category to figure out what's a cat and a dog. Some of it may be pre-coded in the brain, and these are all like really fascinating questions. But in some synthetic setting, can we actually analytically or in a closed form, not to confuse the mathematicians, compute how many samples are actually needed? So that's kind of the, the question. So in order to address the, the question, for instance, of the sample complexity, I somehow need to simplify to be able to do something. So the way I will simplify in this talk, I will work in this what I call the teacher-student scenario. So I will have a teacher network with which I will be generating the data. So this is just a feed-forward fully connected neural network in which I'm feeding random vectors, random input vectors. I, am ch I chosen some ground true weights, x star, so the star will stand for the ground true. And with that network, and chosen my nonlinearity the way I want, and generated the labels y this way. Okay, so there's the teacher network. I know everything about it. I'm not, I no need to learn anything about it. But then the interesting part is the student with, uh, network. So for simplicity, the student network will know the architecture of the teacher network. It will know the nonlinearity. It will get the samples of the data F and it will get the labels the teacher network generated. But it will not get the weights. That's the only thing it's not knowing. Okay, 
And the goal of the student network is to learn the function. If I give it a data sample that for which I didn't give the label, is it able to, rep to reproduce the same label that the teacher would reproduce? Okay, so here I'm somehow reducing that complex model where we are given some data that we don't know where they come from. I'm, re I'm somehow making the chicken, in the, the, the chicken spherical in the vacuum, right? Like as in physics we often do. I say, first of all, the data are random just random IID vectors, every element is independent of the other, which is of course not the case, like picture of a cat is not a random IID noise. And then the function that I'm learning is defined by this teacher. So it seems like very simple question, like can a neural network at least learn a function that is generated by a different neural network? Okay, that seems like a very basic question. So. But at the same time, it seems that maybe I reduced the complexity a lot, that maybe I lost some of the things that I am interested in in the first place. So that's always possible. But here I just want to motivate that, you know, other kind of very recently, other kind of like, leaders of machine learning somehow came up with that setting. So for instance, that's a, that's a talk that Joshua Benjo gave at a conference called Friends is no, friends is AI, sorry, this is not in AI, friends is AI, where he was talking about natural language processing and how do we understand it today and what's somehow the future of that. And here I just zoom on the slide here. So, so that's actually nicely in the topic of, uh, of this conference because one could say that there is, a, imagine an exoplanet and there is an alien life on that exoplanet. And what Joshua was saying that, imagine that unlike on Earth, the communication on that exoplanet is not noisy, but like on Earth, the bandwidth is expensive. So the aliens that communicate try to send messages that are the shortest possible. But there is no noise in their communication, so they don't need any redundancy. So over the years, they somehow figured out how to compress the messages they need to be transmitting each other. And so if we observe such a communication, they will be just transmitting random IID vectors. Because if they were not random IID, they can be compressed farther. Okay? And Joshua's point here was that imagine that now we need to build artificial intelligence for <laughs> natural language processes of such a language. Like how do we even go about it? Because all that we do in practice is somehow using the structure of the, of the language to start with. And here there is no structure. But there are some consequences in the actions of the aliens, depending on what message was sent. So surely there should be some way to understand their language. So there was that's you know I, I don't want to like spend much time on it. And here is another snapshot of a of a uh, of a tutorial given by uh, Sanjeev Arora this time at ICML the, last year, where he was you know in a long tutorial on like somehow mysteries of deep learning. He was giving this, this precisely the same example where we generate labels, labeled data by feeding random input vectors into a single hidden layer neural net. And his point was that it is much easier to train a new net that has much wider hidden layer. And, that he, and, and his somehow mystery was that we have still no theorem why doing that is easier than training that. And, and basically even such a simpler case is mathematically not understood. And so now I'm kind of going back to what Jan Lecan said, that there is a long history of interaction between physics and machine learning. And this is a paper from 30 years ago by people in statistical physics, Elizabeth Gardner and Bernard Derrida, that are studying exactly that teacher-student <coughs> setting in the simplest possible case of just a single neuron. So, so this would be the like, simplest possible neural network we could imagine. In the, so, 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 that's the, so they call it the model B in that paper because the model A, they take the same model with random labels and they use to bound the VC dimension. So the model B is kind of this teacher-student problem where the teacher generates the labels from random vectors with some ground through X star and then the student tries to learn that function back. And the case they studied is when the labels are generated as a sign of the scalar product of the labels and the data point, because at that time the sigmoid or the sign was the popular nonlinearity. And they worked in a regime, which kind of in statistics we call the high dimensional regime, where the dimensionality of the samples, so imagine the number of pixels in the figures, P, 
is going to infinity. The number of samples is also going to infinity, but the ratio between them is some constant, typically five or half, okay? So, so most of statistics in, say, up to 2000s would be in the limit where p is constant and n goes to infinity. But kind of these days, p is also very big. And in this particular setting, the scaling that is interesting is when the ratio between the two is a fixed constant. And okay, so in this paper, they more or less just introduced this model. But the same year, other physicists uh, called Jezza Georgi actually analyzed what's going on in this teacher-student scenario. And he came with this picture for how the generalization error depends on this parameter alpha, which is how many samples we had per dimension. And you see here it's one, here it's two, so it's just few samples per dimension. And now the curve that he's plotting here is the generalization error in units that is the angle between the two vectors or something like that. So you see that when we have few samples, the generalization error is bad. When we have many samples, the generalization error is zero. So, so far, you know, nothing surprising. But what's surprising is that there is a jump, that the generalization error goes discontinuously from some value to zero at a certain point, that is, when alpha is 1.2, this basically stopped working, but that's fine, I guess, uh, 1.245. So from a physics point of view, this means that there is a phase transition. And at least in statistical physics, we love phase transitions and we would like to understand what presence of such a phase transition means for algorithms and what's going on here. And here, he, there is a different line in the figure that he somehow says about it, that it's a non-physical segment of the curve. You see it's kind of the analytical continuation of that curve, as we all often get in bifurcation kind of analysis in phase transitions. And I will get back to that line. But there, there has been literally hundreds of papers in the 90s on these kind of models in the statistical physics literature. And here I just want to you know, jump forward to today and just summarize kind of the key points that they did not have back then in the 90s, which will be, so I didn't say that, but, but the way they obtain these, these results, these, uh, these anal this, closed form curves is by something called the replica method, which is, a, which is a computational method in theoretical statistical physics. That is kind of a recipe that if you follow, you get a result, but mathematically it has holes. It's not like clear why it should actually work. Nevertheless, over the years, people in physics somehow persuaded themselves that it works, but it would still be nice to like have a theorem with every epsilon in it that actually shows that those results are the correct results for, for the model in question. And the second question that is really important that I so far didn't touch is that, okay, maybe we can compute the optimal reachable error. Okay, that's nice. But do we actually have tractable algorithms that are able to reach it? Because if we don't, then this is not very useful. So that's a very important question. And then these two other questions is that what, what happens if we change the nonlinearity and what happens if we change the distribution from which we pick the random, the, the ground true weights of the teacher? So it would be nice to have a formula that somehow encompasses it all. And, and that, so that has not been done back then. But all, all those, we kind of answered them in a paper that came up a year and something ago and just le like last week, it got accepted to PNAS, so I suppose it will come up at some point in 2019. So, so let me walk you through some of the results in that paper. So first, this question of how do we generalize this model to the generic nonlinearity and to the generic <coughs> distribution from which the teacher picked the weights. And in order to do that, we basically set things up in a way that in in statistics or signal processing will be called as the generalized linear model. So instead of doing linear regression, as you know it, we do generalized linear regression in, again, in this teacher-student scenario, meaning the following thing. So we will have some matrix F that is just random IID components that are for simplicity Gaussians of zero means and variance one over N. But what this distribution is in particular is not important. The thing is important that they are independent. And then we will have some ground true weights or signal, if you want, taken from some distribution. 
And then we generate the labels by applying some non-linearity. You pick relu, sigmoid, or constant, this linear function. It can be anything. It can include noise. So this phi will, will, this psi will stand for noise. We generate the labels, and then we give to the student the f and the y, and also for simplicity these distributions. But, but we don't give to the student the x star. The goal is to find the x star. Okay, so here formulated like that, it can seem a bit abstract, but here I just list a list of problems that if you know some of these keywords, it's a problem that can be formulated in this way. So anything from like compressed sensing and ridge regression, phase retrieval, superposition error correcting codes and information theory, some problems in group testing when you test the blood of people. So really, a long list of problems can be modeled or represented in this way. So that's, this generalized linear model is kind of really useful. And for the generalized linear model, so we know in principle how to obtain the optimal performance. Optimal in which sense? In the sense that we want to here. Optimal because it minimizes the mean square error between the statistical estimator that we go after and the ground truth. So that seems like a sensible <laughs> notion of what optimal is. And if we want to minimize that, we know what to do. We just need to write the posterior probability distribution corresponding to the mall. So the way we define it, this is the posterior. And in order to compute this optimal estimator, we need to compute the marginal mean of that posterior. Okay, so so the posterior, it's, it's a probability distribution living on this p-dimensional space and computing its marginals. That means summing over all the dimensions but one. So typically that's something intractable in polynomial time in p or n or both. They scale together. But that's the thing that we should do. And we also know, so that would be for the error on estimating the ground true weights. But also related to that, we can also compute the optimal prediction error or the optimal generalization. If we are given a new sample F, then the way we should estimate the new label is actually not to plug in the optimal weight that would be suboptimal, but is to integrate over the posterior this function, this nonlinearity phi that we got. Okay, so that's, that's just a statement from, say, page 50 of uh, Statistical Inference book. But the trouble, as I said, is that, uh, that we don't know in general how to evaluate it algorithmically. That's exponentially costly. But before going to the algorithms, let me just state the result from our paper. So this is kind of a slide full of equations, so I don't want you really to like read them or understand them. But just what this slide means is that informally that the equations that were given in the papers 30 years ago are the right ones to actually compute the generalization, the best generalization error and the estimation error of this problem. So, so stated more formally, we actually can define what we call the free entropy of this posterior, which is just the expectation of the logarithm of the normalization in that posterior, and that actually converges or concentrates around a supremum of infimum of a function that depends on, a sing on two scalar parameters, m and m hat. And, okay, and this is how it is defined, so that's pretty like uninstructive, the, the, the precise <coughs> form of these equations. But what we gained here is that we reduced a p-dimensional problem where p was large into evaluating a function of two scalar variables. So that's much simpler, like anybody can do it in Mathematica. And you know, a physicist will be happy with having this free energy. If you are not familiar with, say, Bayesian statistics, you will go like, why am I interested in the expectation of the log of the normalization that is not telling me what the error is? Well, this is because the error can be very simply deduced from this free energy in the way that the estimation error is just second moment of this prior minus the m where this expression is maximized. So this is just a fact and you know, say theorem two in our paper and a, a theorem three would be that also the optimal generalization error can be deduced from the maximizer of this formula by another expression that again involves only integrals over scalar variables. So in principle, it's easy to evaluate in, in Mathematica. It's not a high dimensional 
problem or integral or anything like that. So this is a closed formula that can be easily evaluated. And I will be plotting examples. But before plotting the examples, let me go to the algorithmic question, right? Because so far I was not talking about it. So far I just gave you confirmation that these curves from the papers 30 years ago are the right curves. Okay, so that's good to know. But can they be reached algorithmically? So before stating with what algorithm we will be reaching them, I just want to put it into the context of what is done usually. So usually when you train a neural network or you solve a regression, you just minimize some empirical risk or loss function. But note that in the regime where you have limited number of samples or a lot of noise, this is a suboptimal thing to do. Evaluating this bias optimal estimator is actually better in, in general. So, so that's one reason why we want to evaluate the bias optimal estimator. Another reason is that, uh, that, uh, that analyzing actually what the gradient descends or other algorithms that you solve to minimize that loss function, what they do is actually hard. We, even in such a simple setting as my teacher student model here in one like single neuron, neural, uh, neural network, we don't know how in a closed form to actually describe what the gradient descent is doing. So what about algorithms for the bias optimal setting? So when it comes to algorithms for Bayesian estimation, that is you need to sample your probability distribution rather than minimize the loss function, we have a whole chunk of algorithms that we usually do. Of course, for instance, the variational inference algorithms are very common in inference pro in machine learning and in statistical inference, or the gap gap sampling that encompasses all the Monte Carlo kinds of al algorithms that many people use. There will be the Langevin dynamics, which is also used quite widely in many problems. But the one that we will work with is called the loopy belief propagation that is maybe less widely used in practice, but it's really interesting for its theoretical properties. So let me just show how it looks. Again, I don't expect you to understand these equations if you have never seen them before. It's just to say that this algorithm that we call approximate message passing, you know, it's a simple iterative algorithm that is just using multiplications by the data matrix and is implemented in time that is linear in the input size, so you know, it's, it's very kind of non-complicated and one can evaluate the estimators of the marginals and estimators of the new labels for new data sets if we want to. And the big advantage of this algorithm is that we can actually, in a closed form, analyze how much correlated it is to the ground true at every iteration. And this is this state evolution, it's called. So this is from a set of works of uh, collaborators of Andrea Montanari, where, which states that this AT, that would be at time T, what the algorithm estimates the given weight to be, so correlation between this and the ground true weights, so it evolves following these two equations in the middle, which again, like at first sight, seem quite uninstructive, but what's crucial about them, that they are nothing that, they depend on a single scalar parameter, and they are nothing but stationary points of the free energy from the previous slides. So a priori, these two kind of, this is an algorithm before I was evaluating the bias optimal estimator kind of in an abstract, non-constructive way. So a priori, they are not connected, but the analysis tells you they are connected. They are both actually, somehow the same thing. And this is somehow summarizing this bottom line. So we have this one function, the free energy. And the statement is that the bias optimal performance is given by the global maximum of that function. Whereas the performance of the algorithm is given by the, globe, by the local maximum that is the closest one to bad correlation, to m equals zero. So that's, the, that's somehow the result of that theory, okay? So clearly everything reduces to analyzing this function. If, if it has a single maximizer, then this algorithm is reaching up optimality in the limits that we are interested in. And if there are two, then something else is happening. Okay, so, okay, now is the end of somehow the theoretical part. So if you just remember the definition of the student-teacher scenario, 
then you can somehow come back and forget the last say, 10 slides. So now I will show you what, what we can actually, what, what this actually implies for this model of teacher, student of uh, simple neural networks. So first an example where nothing particularly interesting happens. So that will be an example where the nonlinearity <coughs> is a sign and the ground true weights are chosen to be say sparse. Like some of them are Gaussians and some of them are zero. And here I take the 20% of them are Gaussians. You know, th these details are not important and I get a curve like that. So that's the generalization error, the best I can obtain as a function of alpha, which again was the number of samples divided by dimension. So that's kind of the how many more time sample I have per unknown. And the red curve, that's the result of the theory that we get, what's the optimal error. The black points that would be running this approximate message passing algorithm on instances with 10,000, where the dimension is 10,000, and they are supposed to be on the curve when n is infinity, but even for 10,000 they are on the curve. And the blue points that would be comparing to some off-shell method, in this case, logistic regression to solve that classification problem as is implemented in scikit-learn. Okay, and we see that it's a bit above, it cannot be below, but it's not so bad. It's pretty much, uh, you know, reaching the optimal performance. So that's kind of nice, okay, for this like simple regression, class like classification, but this single neuron case, nothing, no, it's kind of positive. The off-shell methods work almost optimally. Now we just change things slightly bit. So the nonlinearity is a sign, but this time the ground true, ground true weights are plus or minus ones, uniformly chosen, okay? And now things change, so things depend on what the ground true weights were. And now again, the red curve would be the performance of the bias optimal estimator. But now the green curve is the theoretical prediction of what the approximate message passing does. So in this case, when, when these two curves agree, it means we had a single maxima, or the global maxima was the same maxima that described the performance of the algorithm. But there is a, there is a region over there that I call hard, where the approximate message passing algorithm doesn't reach the bias optimal performance. Okay, so far nothing particular. One algorithm is not optimal. There will be other algorithms that will be. So let me comment on it on the next slide. But before that, I just show you again the, the result of the off-shell logistic regression here that are the blue points. That kind of at the beginning looks good, but then it doesn't pick this phase transition, this jump of the generalization error to zero. It doesn't see it. It would just go to zero at much later, later point and kind of continuously, not abruptly. So in this case, there is a big gap between like the, what we get with the off-shell algorithms and what we could actually, in theory, get optimally. And another comment, if you remember this picture from like my whatever fifth slide, like this curve that Georgie was dismissing as unphysical, that's actually exactly this green curve. So that describes the behavior of that interesting algorithm. So that kind of, it's not unphysical in this sense. So here just to say where does this, why hard? What, what does that mean physically? Like what, what I described here is a first order phase transition in the physics sense. And it's really the same first order phase transition that we see for instance in diamond. So did you know that diamond is actually not in its equilibrium state, right? The equilibrium state at normal pressure and normal temperature of diamond would just be graphite. So this black, <laughs> uninteresting thing. If we actually manage to turn diamond into graphite, it will heat. It will release heat because graphite is the equilibrium state. Nevertheless, nobody's really worried to buy diamonds that they will turn spontaneously into graphite because the diamond at room temperature and pressure is really, really stable for a really, really long time that we don't need to worry in the lifetime of uh, like maybe not universe, but definitely say humanity or something like that, that it will turn into graphite. <coughs> and so this is summarized in this phase diagram that you know, diamond would be the equilibrium state either at much larger pressure or at much larger temperature, but in this whole kind of green, yellowish triangle, 
it's metastable in the sense that it would, if, if it realized it can be graphite, it would be happier there, but it doesn't realize it. So here it's kind of a good thing, the diamond stays diamond, but in the previous case, the same kind of being stuck in a metastable state is a bad thing, because in that case, the state in which we wanted to go had much lower error, and we didn't get there because of this metastability. So that's kind of a physical, say, analogy of what's going on with the algorithms there. And now to comment on this thing that this is not just one algorithm that stops at that phase transition. This actually is a phase, this kind of a spinodal region of a first order phase transition that has been localized in many, many computational problems. On many of them, you know, we worked in my group. And the conjecture here is that this approximate message bas uh, passing is actually the best among the polynomial time algorithms in these tasks. And that's kind of you know, confirmed and indirectly with relation to some other powerful methods in computer science, such as the semi-definite programs. And, and it seems like there is something fundamental about this phase transition. So, so I really kind of like to think about it. Maybe if we want to cook up something like average, like computation complexity of average problems, this, is, th this will play some role in it. But this kind of a side remark. I want to go back to my simple models of neural networks, and I want to change things again just a little bit. So I will stay with the binary weights, but now I will make the nonlinearity kind of this symmetric sign. So, you know, I just choose this kappa in such a way that half of the labels are plus one and half of them are minus one, but otherwise things are symmetric in the ground true weights. So why not? Okay, it's like one, one function to study. And if I look at a case like that, then I see something interesting that actually the generalization error cannot be better than one up to certain number of samples is reached. And then I have again this hard phase and then only the algorithms start to be working. And if I compare this to some uh, off-shell method, so in this case, logistic regression will just be really bad. So what we took here, we took something like two hidden layers, neural net, and optimized a little bit to get a like, good performance. And even doing that, we could only get, we could get, it started working somewhat. It didn't go to zero. It went to some decent generalization error only when alpha was about 10 times bigger than the numbers that we have here. So, so somehow this seems to be a very simple but hard benchmark for classification. So, you know, to put, uh, <coughs> To, to, to study some of the algorithms and architectures that we are using. You know, if the architecture is kind of fine-tuned to the data, like was, uh, for instance, in some of the previous work, then this is not interesting because our data here are random. But if we think that that algorithm or architecture are kind of universal, well, then they should also work on this example and we can somehow study why they don't or if they do, if one needs to do things differently. So somehow to conclude, or to conclude, to finish on the next, say, three slides, I want to go to a case where now I have hidden variables. Because so far, I spoke about the, the, the simplest possible model where I didn't even have hidden variables. And even that is like mathematically kind of interesting and challenging, and there are jumps in the generalization errors, etc. But so here, I will go to a case where we, in the physics literature, again, it was studied in the 90s, early 90s. It was called the committee machine. So it's a neural network, as before. The kind of limitation with respect to feed-forward neural networks used today is that the number of hidden units has to be of order one, while the dimension and the number of samples go to infinity with a fixed ratio. Okay, so in practice, the hidden layers would be rather large. Okay, here we can have, so we can have several of them, but they have to be small, so that the, the mathematical description that we get of the algorithm and of the bias optimal error stays valid. And so this is something that appears in, in our paper in NeurIPS this year. And studying a model like that, we really start with like the simplest possible case when we have two hidden units. But already a simple case like that actually reveals something that practitioners of machine learning know. So if you, you know, did machine learning, but you had a very limited number of samples, which sometimes in, say, medical applications or some colleagues that 
that want to apply machine learning to predict energies in their like density function, like replace the density functional modeling by, by machine learning, they encounter this case where the number of samples is really, really not so big. And in those cases, some hope practitioners know that using deep learning is not so useful, that one actually gets the same good results just by doing kernel rich regression. So just do not having multiple layers, just having one layer. And Somehow this observation can be quantified in this model of committee machine with already two hidden units. And we call it this specialization phase transition. So from the theory that I described, we can compute, you know, up to, you know, in a close form, like these curves are just evaluation of some integrals. We can show that there is a critical value of a number of samples below which it's actually not advantageous to consider the two hidden units as different, that it's just better that they both learn the same thing. And that's the best thing that can be done. You cannot do better. And if you have more <coughs> samples than that, then it starts to be advantageous to actually specialize each of the hidden units to one of the hidden units of the teacher. And then you get a better generalization error by doing that. And so this will be just with two hidden units. So there, the, the, there is a phase transition, but it's continuous. See, it goes, to, nothing happens, it's not discontinuous. But in the limit where the number of hidden units is large, so we could see that the same spe specialization phase transition appears, but now this hard phase, this computational gap comes back. So if we actually analyze what happens for the, from the information theoretic point of view, so disrespective of algorithms, we need number of samples that goes like some constant times number of hidden units times the dimension. But if we want to be able to achieve it algorithmically, there is a different constant and we need to replace the number of hidden units by its square. So there is a huge gap in terms of the sample complexity where information theoretically we should be able to learn the function, but we don't have tractable algorithms to do that. So how that somehow influences what we actually see in, in, neural, in actual neural networks. That's kind of work in doing, how to make that more realistic. And that's what I want to conclude with. It's kind of like a selected list of, uh, of directions in which, in which we are going either very recently or currently, of which I want to point maybe the third point that like one of the weaknesses of what I have been telling you is that the data, the input was IID, which of course is not realistic. We would like to know how the conclusions change if this is not the case. So we actually realized that we can treat more complicated case where the data actually come as an output of a generative network that had an IID input. So okay, if that was more complicated, ask me about it later. But that's kind of interesting. That's putting interesting structure in the input data, yet <coughs> still keeping it within the framework that, that we can analyze. So that's kind of making definitely a step towards being more realistic in, in terms of modeling what actual neural networks look like and the data on which they, on which they are employed. And okay, then. The slides will be online, I suppose, so you can read it. I will rather wrap up with just the list of references where you can read about these things.